The scary stories will start in 40 seconds. Before they do, I just want to remind you to subscribe to my channel. If you're new here, then please know that I stand by something I call my minimal ad promise. This means that there's only two mid-roll ads in this video, so that you won't be interrupted over and over again when you're trying to enjoy the stories and the rain. So if you enjoy this video and want to show your support to this channel, then please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It helps me more than you know. Now, let's begin. What you are about to hear is real. The events happened, and I still to this day don't understand it, and do not expect you to either. Theories and possible explanations are hugely welcomed. I work in a well-known clothing retail store in the UK, and I work in the stock room as part of the delivery stock team. About two or three weeks before Christmas 2014, I had asked my store manager if I could work some overtime to get more money for Christmas presents, and she thought this was a smart move as my stockroom manager was out of the country on holiday for a week visiting family also. Nearing to Christmas, the deliveries get pretty big, almost three times the size of regular deliveries, so there was the work available for me to come in and complete. It would involve stripping clothes from packets and hanging them within the stockroom. My manager had asked that rather than come in on a day I don't usually work, that I should instead stay for additional hours, past my contracted ones, which meant that I had to lock up. My manager trusted me to do this, as I've worked there for almost three years now, so she handed me her master key. The only other master key was with my stockroom manager, who was currently out of the country. This is where it begins. The time was nearing 8 p.m. at night. All of my colleagues had left the building, and I had locked the door after them, turned off the store music, and secured the bottom loading bay, where the deliveries come in. I was in the stockroom on the second floor putting some hangers on the racking so that I could use them for the next delivery. I was standing underneath a puppy teddy bear that was stuffed between a pipe and a wooden piece of racking facing me. The teddy was an old toy from a delivery that was left behind, and my colleagues had given it a name. A name I can't remember, because the teddy isn't really spoken of much. It just sits there. My iPod was plugged into a pair of speakers that had been in the stockroom since ever, and I was happily completing my task. Until I heard a noise. Yes, that might sound cliche, but this noise was very familiar, and it was the noise of the bottom loading bay shutters being opened. I thought someone must be in the store, as the only way to open and shut them is from a panel next to them, from the inside. So I paused my music and proceeded to walk down the stairs, out back to the bottom loading bay. When I was about halfway down, the noise suddenly stopped. What I can say that always creeps me out about the place is that the lighting around the corridors, staircases, and stockrooms were lit up by strip lights, and these strip lights had sensors on them. So whenever you walked under, you would hear a small click and it would come on. So there I was gliding down the stairs. Click, click, click. I burst into the loading bay, expecting to see one of my colleagues, but lo and behold, it was empty. The shutters were shut. I embraced a tingle down my spine, and simply spun around and paced back to my workstation in the stockroom. I illuminated the strip lights and continued to hang some more hangers, the music from my iPod playing along, calming my nerves. Until I remembered, I turned my iPod off. I spun around horrified and just stared at my iPod over on the shelf. As I took a breath and shook my head, I caught a glimpse, a glimpse of where the teddy should have been sitting. I was drenched with panic and took a step back to look further down the stockroom about a 100-yard stretch where I had suspected a culprit had fled. 
only to face darkness. I stood for a moment, still bewildered by what had just unfolded, when I heard a faint click. I instantly moved to my right to get a good look down the stockroom, but yet, I still faced darkness. Click, 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 was all I heard, gradually getting louder, closer. This is when Pavlov's theory kicked in, and I realized no lights were switching on in sync with the click. No light switched on at all. I turned to the door to see my only exit route, and then spun my head around back to be greeted with a dark figure in the distance. The figure was big, what I can only describe as perhaps a male bodybuilder. I need glasses for long distance things, and usually only wear them in the cinema or at football games. Anyway, the darkness didn't help. Within his hand, I could see a small object, although when the hand clutched at it, I could make out that this was the teddy. This is when I felt adrenaline scream. Run. Out of the stockroom, down the corridor, through two doors, and to my right, straight into the ladies' bathroom, opposite the two offices, I ran straight into one of the four cubicles, the middle one, and locked myself in. I crouched on the toilet, shaking, partly because I'm a tall guy, and partly because my heart was hammering in my ears, putting my balance off. The doors of the toilet took a while to close slowly, as they should, and I listened for anybody to be approaching. The doors shut closed, which gave me little relief, and I stopped and blinked, thinking for a moment. I wiped the sweat off my brow with my left forearm. As my head turned to meet my arm, I glanced down at the bottom of the cubicle. A face was there. A face was pulling away from underneath, just as I caught a glimpse of the mouth and the nose. My only description is that the teeth were black and seemed slightly bloody, and by the grayish skin tone and wrinkles, the person was old. I was injected with pure fear when I screamed, Screw off! and kicked at the door, making it shake and slam, echoing around the walls in a thunderous noise. I swung the door open, looked back, took a deep breath, and braced myself before darting out of the bathroom into the front of the store. I was charging along, preparing to attack anything to save myself from injury, yet nothing stood between me and the front door. I unlocked it with shaking hands and ran outside. I knew I had left my coat and iPod inside, but I was eager to get out. Locking the sliding doors behind me, I spun to the shutter lock on the wall. It's located at the bottom of the wall, and for this reason I am unsure of, as it's always been a hassle for people. I turned the key inside the lock, and the shutters were descending. The store shutters were on the inside of the store, just past the alarms, and as I crouched there, slowly watching the shutters come down, again, I witnessed the figure, still holding the teddy, in the middle of the shop floor. It was dark outside, and it was dark inside at this point. The shop floor lights are different, and have to be switched on in the office. I closed my eyes and begged the shutter to hurry as it hit the floor, and I snatched the key away and ran down the road to the high street. My phone was in my pocket where it's always kept, so I called the police and told them what happened. I told them I believed a person had broken in. The police arrived shortly after, and I let them into the store. I had them escort me to the office to turn the lights on, and as I reached the office, I noticed the computer was on. I told them this wasn't on before, but they sped me up to turn the lights on so that they could search the store. After touring them around the store to search, even the lift, they found nobody and told me to go home. The officers said that they would contact my manager tomorrow. The next day, I arrived at work at opening time, even though I wasn't scheduled to work. I was greeted by different officers from the night before and my store manager. We proceeded to go to the office just after my manager had opened the store and let my colleagues set up. The officers had said 
that they would continue a search that day and night, again, and that my manager should ask for CCTV to be installed. I walked to the stockroom to get my iPod and coat before leaving, when one last stab of fear yanked my heart to my boots when I glared at the teddy, stuffed back into its usual space. I was allowed two contracted days off that week to rest. I think my manager thought I was seeing things and needed to sort myself out. I returned to work as usual. I was happy to do so, as it was within the daytime and the store was full with people. Nothing has happened since. I still don't know how it was possible or what happened. If it was a prank, if someone or people had a motive. Some people think I'm crazy. Some think that it might have been a group of people. I began babysitting at 13 to earn extra money to spend on horribly embarrassing things like Fallout Boy CDs. I would almost always work for my dad's clients, who was a lawyer, and get referred by word of mouth. I was babysitting for this one family who had a little girl that was nine and a little boy that was seven. The parents seemed okay, if a tad bit crotchety, giving me a full schedule to follow and jokingly threatening to beat any boy who might mysteriously show up after they left. It felt cruel for them to accuse me of even knowing a boy, given I basically looked like an overgrown baby with frizzy hair at that age. Almost immediately after the parents leave, the little girl sings in a creepy high-pitched voice, We're all alone now. I know, the little boy chimed in. Let's play murder. Looking back now, I know the kid probably just heard the term on TV knew the word was shocking and said it just for a reaction, but I totally bought into it at the time, sputtering, wide-eyed, and changing the subject quickly. These kids were hell for the next hour. I wouldn't let them watch South Park on TV because their parents did not seem like the type to allow their precious seven and nine-year-old to watch a show like that. As soon as I said no, the little girl said casually, Oh, that's fine. We'll just go play PlayStation in the family room. Feel free to stay out here. I knew exactly where that was headed. I said they could watch any other TV show in the living room while I made them dinner. The parents had left instructions to make them sandwiches. I could handle that. Before I had even got out the bread, I hear a massive crash. Completely shocked and pissed, but ultimately with no way to punish her, I cleaned it up while these two incredibly weird kids watched with wide eyes and smiles. Dumping the broken glass of the vase they broke in the trash, I went back to making the sandwiches. I'm a vegetarian, so while these kids had chicken, I had made myself a simple salad. Just as I was finishing, the little boy screamed out in what sounded like a pantomime of pain. Nonetheless. I ran over to the couch in the living room to check on him. My ankle! He howled, dramatically flopping into the couch. While I tried to figure out how he had hurt his ankle, the little girl slipped out of the room. Peripherally, I was aware of this, but didn't really pay it any mind. I was focused on the little boy, pretending to be in pain. He kept saying, I went to stand, but it hurt too much, over and over until his eyes suddenly flicked to just behind me, where I could see the little girl standing with a perturbing smile on her face. He was miraculously healed. Yeah, right. At this point, I was just thinking that these kids were really weird, craved attention a little too much, and probably needed more parental involvement. Whatever, I was 13, and that $60 was only four hours away. I set out the sandwiches for the two kids to eat at the dining room table, went to get all of us soda, and then returned. After pouring soda for the both of them, I realized they hadn't even taken a bite of their sandwiches yet. I asked them what they were waiting for. 
They smiled. For you to take a bite of yours. I am so glad I had the gut feeling to lift up the top piece of bread on my sandwich. Because when I did, I saw broken glass. Broken glass that I had put in the trash earlier. I stared in horror at the two little kids staring at me with menacing grins. I lost it, shouting, Are you serious? At the very least, you could have really injured my mouth. What's wrong with you two? Instead of crying or apologizing or pretending to be ashamed or confused, these two kids began laughing. Not like kids. It was too low. It was low and threatening. I will never forget that noise. My immediate reaction was, these kids are too young to be laughing like that. I called my older sister who was 17 at the time, crying about what had happened, and she came and took over for me. We left the house with chills after the parents arrived. I never babysat for those two again. What I can't get past is the level of premeditation that went into sprinkling that broken glass into my sandwich and the totally remorseless way they responded to my getting upset. They were unlike any two kids I have ever met before or since. This memory I've tried to block out, but the other day when my siblings and I were talking about funny stuff my dad did when he was alive, and how humorously absent-minded he was as a parent, this long-forgotten memory came back to me, and I can't stop thinking about it. When I was four years old, I had a playground fall that resulted in a serious cut to the back of my head that needed stitches. A few weeks later, my dad took me back to the doctors to have them removed. I was very brave and sat very still for the doctor. So as a reward, my dad got me an ice cream and took me to the beach for a paddle. It was a very small Australian town and the beach was quite secluded. Even though it was the middle of summer, there was only a handful of slightly older children swimming, mind you, without their parents. My dad walked me down to the water's edge and warned me sternly to stay in the shallow water and not to go in any deeper than my knees. Then he disappeared. I imagined to use the public restroom or something. I know that looks bad, but he wasn't a bad father. As I mentioned before, he could just be a bit irresponsible and absent-minded at times. It drove my mom insane. There was an older boy about 10 years old or possibly a little older. He was paddling around a few meters away, but slowly came in closer, leaving the other children. Then he called out to me. I remember he had blonde hair and was smiling. He asked me what my name and my age was. I answered, also filling him in on all the important details about my trip to the doctors that morning, emphasizing that I had been very brave to impress him. My story seemed to amuse him, and he asked why I didn't come out and swim a little deeper. I explained that I wasn't allowed in past my knees until my dad came back, because I couldn't swim very well yet and would get into trouble. He assured me that I couldn't possibly get into trouble if he was teaching me how to swim, and besides, my dad wouldn't see because he wasn't there. When I was still hesitant, he added, Are you scared? I thought you were brave. So I followed him out until my feet couldn't touch the bottom, and he immediately grabbed me and pushed me under the water. I am getting angry and upset just thinking about it. I struggled, but he was more than twice my size. I realize now that he had taken me out willingly so that the other kids wouldn't know what he was up to. Drowning an unattended young child really is the perfect crime because you could very easily pass it off as an accident. Probably only moments before I lost consciousness, the boy abruptly let go and my dad lifted me out of the water. 
I can still see the look of bewilderment mixed with fear and rage on my dad's face. Then, for what seemed like a very long time, he patted my back while I screamed, sobbed, and coughed over his shoulder. By the time I had settled and my father was satisfied that I was okay, the boy and the other kids were long gone, although my dad still went driving around looking for them. Had that kid stuck around, I'm quite certain my dad would have killed him. When I was young, from the ages of 2 to 10, I lived on a 7-acre ranch. There was a small house in the front of the property where we lived, a huge grass yard, a cabinet shop behind it, and an orchard in the very back, full of walnut trees. My father was a carpenter that always worked in the shop, and my mother was a school teacher that was almost always busy. Because of their jobs, and the fact that they were new to parenting, as I got older, they really didn't pay as much attention as they should to where I would wander off. I would spend my days roaming around the yard, playing in the dirt, and running through the walnut trees. I obviously didn't question my lack of supervision, as it was fun to explore this huge plot of land, and I just thought I was being a normal kid. When I was about seven years old, my father surprised me with a brand new, child-sized ATV. It wasn't one of the electric ones that you are probably picturing, either. It was a really fast, gas-powered quad. Now, at this point, a good amount of you are probably questioning why someone would give a gas-powered ATV to a seven-year-old child. But like I said, my parents were a bit reckless, and they, well, my dad, just wanted me to have fun. Pretty much right after I got it, I learned how to ride it by myself, and started going farther into the property and past it than I ever had before. I now had a free ride to basically go as far as my young self wanted before turning back. I started riding through the orchards behind my house almost every day, and I loved it more than anything. I would leave my house and be gone for hours. After a while, I gradually started roaming farther and farther away from my house as I became more brazen and a little older. I would ride down this dirt path that led past what I assumed was our neighbor's land and to a ditch that held water. At the time, I just liked looking at the water as it flowed, and I felt like I was a little explorer. I honestly never contemplated that what I was doing could be the least bit dangerous, and I really don't think my parents knew how far I was riding. When I think back on it now, just the idea of riding a pretty dangerous piece of equipment far away from my house, without my parents knowing where I was, and before cell phones existed, is pretty scary in itself, as I could have crashed or hit my head and no one would have been able to find me. So, one day, like every other day, I was riding far away from home and I passed by a man wearing a dirty white shirt, denim jeans, and a wicker farmer's hat. I remember it vividly as it was the first person that I had seen in all the time I had been out there. I remember the surprised look in his eyes as he stared at me while I rode past him. I had no reason to stop, and my parents had always taught me about stranger danger, so I kept going and forgot about it. On the way back home, a couple hours later, I was coming up to the same spot, and it dawned on me that this is where I had seen the man. I looked ahead, not expecting him to be there. As I said, it had been hours later. Yet as the trees parted, there he was. I really didn't think it was too weird, because I figured that he was a farmer, so I kept driving, coming closer to where he was. He seemed friendly, to be honest. He had a big smile on his face, like he was happy to see me. To my ten-year-old self, I just thought he was a friendly guy, so I waved at him as I passed by, and he waved back. I continued on my way and drove home not thinking much about it. I don't really remember how much time had passed between then and the next time I went riding, but it couldn't have been more than a couple of days. 
Like usual, I took the same dirt road, past the same few orchards, to the same ditch that was full of water. I didn't think much about my previous encounter, so I hadn't been thinking about the stranger with the big smile. I was sitting on the edge of the ditch when I heard footsteps in the dirt coming up from behind me. Again, I remember this vividly because it was not a common occurrence to see anyone on this trail. I remember being more curious than scared and turned around to see the same stranger with the smile. This time, his smile seemed to be more of a toothy grin. He called out to me as he walked up, asking what my name was in a heavy southern drawl. I told him with confidence that I wasn't really allowed to talk to strangers, to which he said, That's a good idea, although you really shouldn't be out here all by yourself. It can be dangerous for a kid your age. I remember this striking me in the gut with a little bit of a butterfly feeling. I wasn't afraid, but I felt uneasy. This piqued my curiosity, however, as I wondered what he meant. So I asked him. He continued to walk closer to me slowly and answered. I heard they found a little boy out here, just around your age. I think it was that ditch right there where he drowned. I would like to point out here that although my parents were reckless, they were not stupid. If there had been a drowning near our house that was reported, or there had been a story in the paper, they definitely wouldn't have let me come here anymore. Why don't you come with me, and I'll take you back to your parents. It's not safe out here for a kid your age. Uh, it's okay. I have my quad right there. I'll just ride back. I pointed over to the side of him where my quad was, but he didn't look. His eyes remained fixed on me. They were dark brown, almost black, and piercing into me. At this point, I was scared, and I knew that this could be a bad situation. I was hoping that he was just a concerned old man, but there was no way that I was going with him anywhere. I got to my feet to start walking to my quad, to which the man said, Should a kid your age be riding something that dangerous? Let's just put it in my truck, and I'll give you a ride back. I don't see a truck, I said, looking around, hoping to talk my way out of the situation. Oh, it's right over there, on my property. You can't see it from here, he said, his smile widening. It's really okay, I'll just go now, I said, starting again to walk to my quad. But as I passed him, he reached out and grabbed my arm. You really shouldn't be out here, he said, staring me deep in the eyes. It's not safe for little kids. Let me go, you're hurting me, I shouted, starting to panic, but this only made him grip tighter. Maybe you don't deserve to go back home. What kind of parents would let their kid be out here all alone? Maybe you should come home with me, and I'll take care of you. At this point, I was about to pee my pants. I was freaking out, and I started to scream. I don't know if I was saying anything. I just know I was screaming as loud as I ever had before. This only seemed to anger him, as his once toothy grin turned to a face of anger. He put his hand over my face, and I took this opportunity to bite his finger as hard as I could. I still remember the taste of his blood, so I know I hurt him pretty bad. Thankfully, this caught him off guard as he finally let me go. I knew this was my one chance to get away, so I booked it to my quad as he winced in pain. Get back here, he cried in anger. I knew I didn't have much time, so I jumped on my quad and turned the key as fast as I could. It started up, and just as I pulled the gas handle, I felt a hand start to grab my neck. Luckily, he didn't have a grip yet, as I was already starting to drive away. I punched it and sped away. At this point, all I could hear was the sound of my quad, so I wasn't sure if he was running after me, but I wasn't going to look as I could possibly crash if I did. I drove down that dirt path as fast as the quad would go,
probably the fastest that I had ever driven it. When I got home, I peeled out into the dirt and ran into my house, hoping that my mom was home. I burst into her room, bawling, and there she was. She asked me what was wrong, but I couldn't talk yet, as I was so afraid. I just kept crying. I think I cried for a good thirty minutes before I could summon up the strength to stop and tell her what happened. I remember the fear in her eyes as I described what happened. She pulled me close to her and hugged me as hard as she ever had. The next day, I talked to a police officer and recounted the story of what transpired. I honestly don't remember much after this, as I think I started to block it out. It's not really something a ten-year-old wants to think about. Needless to say, they never let me off the property again. My dad started drinking, and we lost the house soon after this anyway, so I didn't have to live there much longer. Recently, I was thinking about that day after I started trying to remember various parts of my childhood. My parents had never told me what happened after the cops were called, and I had never really asked, because I tried not to think about it. So yesterday, I went to her house and asked her if they ever found the guy, considering he had to live pretty close to our property. She was kind of startled by the question, because we hadn't talked about it in 15 years. She paused for a minute, as if pondering whether to tell me, and then said, We didn't have any neighbors out that way. It was all corporate-owned land, and the description you gave didn't match any of the neighbors in the other direction. We called the cops and they went to search where you told us you were, but the guy was long gone by the time they got out there. They looked around the property and found an abandoned house that hadn't been used in years since the land was purchased. When they looked inside, they could tell that he had been staying there. Apparently, he left his stuff behind. We never told you this because you were way too young, but one of the things they found was a black grocery bag. It had a roll of duct tape inside and a hunting knife. Uh, thanks, Mom. But did I really need to know that? Hey, it's Being Scared. Are you enjoying the video so far? If so, please consider subscribing if you haven't already. I promise I will always make these videos for you. Always with minimal ads. All right, back to the stories. My freshman year of college was one of the funnest years of my life, and some of my fondest memories are from that year. But it was also the scariest and strangest year to date, and I'm 31 now. This is thanks to one story in particular that takes place over the entire school year. I still sometimes wonder how this really happened and I didn't end up a nut job and it still freaks me out to this day. I've only talked about it once or twice since it happened 13 years ago. August 2001. Like most freshmen, I live in the dorms at a state party school. I opted out of the good school that I got into. I guess I had a little steam to blow off after graduating from a military school. Plus, after a sports injury, I didn't exactly have any specific plan for life that went past Saturday night, if you know what I mean. A good buddy from military school, Bill, went to the same college and lived a few floors below in the same dorm as me. So of course, we were getting the party started before my parents' exhaust fumes had even evaporated from the parking lot. For the most part, the first month or so of college was pretty much normal. I went to most of my classes, partied just about every night, chased girls around, and that was enough for the moment. But things began to change one night sometime in mid-September, and college for me would never be normal again. My dorm phone rings in the middle of the night. Hello? On the other end, I can only really describe the voice as the kind you would picture when you think about a computer talking, 
kind of like the early model car GPSs. Hi Gary, how are you today? Not fully awake, I'm just confused at this point. Uh, who is this? He repeats. Hi Gary, how are you today? It becomes clear that I'm being messed with, so I hang up and chuckle. Bill, nice one. And then I pass back out in my bed. I end up forgetting about the call for a few days, and never mentioned it to Bill or anyone else. About a week later, I get another call around the same time of night. Hi Gary, I am watching you. Oh nice, very cliché. Seriously, Bill, how are you not knee-deep in Everclear by now? Enough already, I'm starting to get pissed. I hang up the phone. I casually confront my oh-so-clever amigo at breakfast the next morning, purposely not trying to bite too hard to give him a payoff that might incentivize continued calls. I also wasn't 100% sure that it actually was him and not another one of my friends. He gives a genuinely confused response. Whatever. So a couple days after the second call, I come home and see that I have multiple messages on my answering machine. What the heck? I barely knew that that thing even worked. It was the computer voice guy. Message number one. My machine cuts off within one to two seconds of the message, which tells me it's a bot. Hi, Gary. I am watching you. Message number two. I thought I asked you to answer my calls, Gary. Message number three. Where might Gary be on a Tuesday night? Okay, so one of my friends is messed up enough or bored enough to really push for a reaction here. The next day, I play the messages for Cade, our other roommate, who was around during the calls which were apparently earlier in the night when he was still awake. He had been a close buddy since we were in junior high, but we had sort of taken separate paths after high school. So anyway, he's aware that I'm a wild child, and thinks nothing of the first couple messages. By the third message, he is a little spooked. I then walk down to a couple other buddies' rooms, and casually, but immediately bring up the subject. Nothing. Over the next couple of days, I press all close and semi-close friends, but get zero answers and zero suspects. The calls start coming more frequently over the next couple months, starting at once a week, then to once every two to three days, up to every day by Christmas break. I don't say anything to my family at that point, although I really, really should have. What started out as a decent beginning of college turned into not showing up for any classes, tests, nothing. My grades reflect, and I am too busy answering for a .67 GPA to talk about some dumb prank that would likely be dismissed as a pathetic attempt at grades explanation. So it goes. Uneventful break, and back to school, determined to become a new man. I have to get it together with these grades so I tell Bill that I'm going to have to chill out and focus on school. My first night back, I get my first spring semester phone call. How is your family in Cyprus? Which is my hometown suburb. Okay, this is not funny anymore. What kind of jerks am I hanging out with that even have the discipline to drag out a prank this long? I get the answer to that question a few days later. And the answer is none of them. The calls become threatening and downright dark. I'm very interested, Gary, in being close to you. Yeah, with kind of the weird sentence structure like that. I have tools I can bring. It is going to all be over soon. One day, I bring Bill and all my other friends up to hear the messages. I never deleted a single one for some reason. I guess when things happen over longer periods of time, you don't really feel the cumulative impact until laying out the complete package of evidence. The guys are in shock. 
I guess I should mention that some of these calls got really specific in making sure to note specific details about my parents' address, as well as the violence they are planning on doing to me. Cut open your esophagus, Gary, with a butter knife. And all sorts of other crap like that, that is sort of blurred together through hundreds upon hundreds of calls that I received over the school year. A female friend of mine that I had really liked in high school named Layla goes to a different school hundreds of miles away. We have reconnected thanks to good old AIM, which was AOL Instant Messenger, and talked from time to time on the phone. The creepy electronic voice that left me messages had mentioned a couple of times, Your friend and made threats about this unspecified person from time to time. But, your friend, turned into, your friend Layla. Layla and I are the only two people ever named in these calls, but it did get me wondering if this was a new lead to the source. Layla is clueless when I call her about it. One night, we're all partying and drinking at some hotel, a different buddy of mine, named Carl, has a nice big truck that we would all go everywhere in, but he had passed out drunk at the hotel, after pounding an entire bottle of whatever. I'm not really drinking tonight, and want to get back to my own bed. I snatch Carl's keys to drive back to campus, thinking that I'll drive back to the hotel in the morning to get everyone. This was one of the few times I had even driven that year so I wasn't tip-top on my directions. I make an early turn and am somehow down a road that I have never seen. I realize this pretty quick, but I figure I've got the general direction of campus pegged so I can just continue the wrong road until hitting the familiar highway that I knew I would eventually have to hit. I'm finding myself in open fields, still a paved road, but aside from the road, there was absolutely nothing, and it was completely black. Around 3 o'clock a.m., I came to this really strange four-way stop. Strange, because I'm probably the fourth person in a year to drive on that road. I trudge along, eventually get to the familiar highway, and home free. A few days later, the creepy voice guy interrupts his usual depraved threatening to mention that specific four-way, the day and time that I was on it, which, like I said, was around three o'clock in the morning, and there wasn't a soul in sight. So yeah, I now realize that this person that's been leaving messages is obviously tracking my movements. I never mentioned it to anyone, and to this day, I have no idea how this person knew where I was in the middle of these roads. Around March, this apparent rendezvous became the creepy voice guy's focal point, and he would make sure to let me know that this day was close. The calls were coming in no fewer than 10 or 15 times every single day. Seriously. The ringer was now off out of courtesy to my other roommate, Cade and I turned down the volume of the answering machine as his phone calls recorded. But I finally get the message I had been waiting for. Keep in mind, I have now become somewhat famous, or infamous I guess, at this university because of the creepy voice guy. People were constantly knocking on my front door, wanting to hear the messages. Friend of a friend or whoever, I was all people wanted to hear about at parties. Blah blah blah. For a split second it was getting cool, because I'm pretty sure I ended up getting a few dates indirectly from introductions conceived through interest in the creepy voice guy. Don't judge me. Moving right along, the day, time, location are set. We will meet in front of Coleman Hall at midnight Wednesday, 27 April, and we will take our friendship to the next level. I know what you're thinking, and yeah, throughout the year I had considered the possibility that I was dealing with a female. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, and I was definitely that kind of guy when I was 18 or 19 years old, the kind that could attract clinginess and anger. But 
I started to rule out female for various reasons that only a fellow would understand. I can build profiles with a very high ratio of accuracy to available information. This creep just didn't feel like a female to me. It didn't even feel like a peer. I was convinced I was dealing with a mid-30s white male computer nerd that I had come into contact with at some point in my life. It doesn't really matter because what I ended up finding out on April 27th, the Wednesday, which by the way was Layla's birthday, I was wrong. Of course, everyone wants to be a part of this juicy story and there's a pretty ridiculous amount of testosterone floating around the dorm on game day. This was a real life creep and a legit horror story unfolding before their very eyes and groupthink will subvert caution if properly motivated. These guys are ready to defend me with their lives. Just ask them. So while these guys are getting all hopped up on Mountain Dew, I stay home that afternoon wondering what I was going to do at midnight. Of course I was going to go, but man, yeah, I've always been an athlete in good shape. Wrestling, football, baseball, yada yada. But I'm still a 19 year old male. Good parents, grew up in middle upper class suburbia, and had a good life. In other words, I can definitely hold my own in a street fight. But this, whatever this is, doesn't feel anything like a street fight or any other kind of fight I had ever been in. This is a disturbed, violent, angry, possibly psychopath that has decided to dedicate almost a full year now of his life to targeting and terrorizing me. So yeah, I'm a little freaking nervous. My home team crowd steadily built up throughout the afternoon and evening, with probably close to 70 or 80 guys grouped up at our dorm's common area, smoking cigarettes and hanging out. Once the party hour approaches, though, over half of the guys splinter off into other various propositions that probably included more traditional fun like beer bongs and sorority girls. I'm left with about a 15-20 member platoon. I had decided earlier that I was not going to allow all these knuckleheads to shadow me, but I could definitely use them in case of emergency. I didn't want to risk him spooking out of the meat, so I let them know that they will need to stay inside the doors of the common area while I walk out to the meeting spot. Coleman Hall was adjacent to our connected girls dorm and about 300 paces outside door to door to get to Coleman. The witching hour finally came, so I leave my crew to begin the longest couple hundred or so paces of my life. My boys can see me through the glass doors, but wouldn't really be able to see me much once I got to the Coleman Hall door. About 100 paces out from my spot, I observe two things at the same time. One, some kind of small quick movement in front of the patio walkway that goes all the way around the building. And two, the movement was in a spot along the walkway where the only normally uber bright bulb is out. I'm not exactly sure how I was able to see him, but I suddenly realize Someone is crouched behind one of the cookie-cutter bushes outside the patio perimeter against one of the building pillars. In dark clothes and a hoodie, he is a few feet off from the path where I'm supposed to meet him, and positioned to where I really should not have been able to see him, given the pillar blocking any shadow plus the burnt-out light. In fact, I could have easily walked all the way to the door without ever having noticed someone down there. Nope. I sort of jump mid-step as this happens, and I see him raise up a little, thinking that I might have seen him. I see him raise up and take a step toward me, and that's when fight or flight hits me. I've learned that my particular fight or flight chooses fight in more mild situations flight during intense situations, but for moments like this, 
where I feel that my life could genuinely be in danger. It's scarier to run away with your back to whatever scary crap that I'm dealing with. So I fight. Before I realize what I'm doing, I'm in a dead sprint towards this guy who I'm guessing sees what I can't yet, which is my platoon busting through the glass doors in pursuit. The creep immediately starts running away, running on the patio alongside Coleman Hall toward the parking lot. I can tell that this isn't the mid-30s computer nerd that I predicted. This guy is above average height and above average build athletically. That's all I could tell, really. I'm really booking it as he right turns on a dime at the edge of the building. I realize I'm moving fast enough to catch him, but everyone else is really far behind. I also realize that I'm moving so fast, I won't be protected as I turn hard right at the corner of the building. If he stops there, I'm toast. As I turn the corner, I see the van sitting alone in the parking lot in front of me. It's running, and brake lights flicker on and then off, park into drive, and begins inching forward towards the exit. The guy, of course, is heading for the van, which for some reason sent this whole new level of fear into me. This is it. This is really happening, and I am going to get murdered tonight. But I can't stop. Something keeps me moving forward. I guess I had come this far, dealt with this crazy bullcrap for almost a full year now, completely unable to do anything other than try to ignore it. I'm not exactly going places academically at this point, and my life doesn't quite have all that much purpose to it yet. If I'm going to be killed, I will at least know, and this crap will at least be over. Plus, I still have a chance to catch this madman before he gets away. If I could get close enough to dive tackle, I would still be on my own to deal with this creep. His driver, and now I realize there's a third guy that was manning the sliding door. Awesome. I don't care how bad you think you are when you're a 19-year-old jock. Your chances of taking down three grown men that are already violent criminals and prepared to victimize are about one in not going to freaking happen. My turn is wide and slow due to me being in a full-on sprint, and I lose ground. I'm probably 20 yards from the lot when he does a flying leap into the side of the van. There couldn't have been any rows of seats for a leap like that. The creep slams the sliding door shut as the van peels out of the parking lot, hangs a right, and is gone in an instant. The relief of not being kidnapped, bound, and gagged in the van with three psychos who most likely had some pretty horrific plans for me is now just as strong as the dread of the fact that this is still not over. I was speechless, and so was my platoon as they catch up a minute later. A few of them caught up enough to witness the parking lot scene, but no one was talking. Testosterone has now been replaced with genuine and earnest concern. They all just stood there with me, catching their breath and making sure I was alright. One guy asks if anyone got a plate number, not even I did. Not enough light. We finally start walking back, and I'm reliving the scene as we retrace our steps. As we get closer to the original meeting spot, I see something that scares me more than anything else in the entire equation has up to this point. On the opposite side of the pillar where the creepy guy was crouching, there's a video camera sitting on a stand pointed right at the spot I would have been standing when I should not have been able to notice him. And it was still recording. I'm retelling this story on behalf of my departed grandmother. Truth oftentimes is stranger than fiction, and this story has been passed down through our family for years. It serves as a reminder that you can never be too careful. I don't know the exact year, but this took place during the 1950s when my grandmother was in her 20s and living in a very rural area of Kansas. 
At this time, she had already given birth to my mother. However, she claimed to be stepping out on my grandfather with another woman. I have no idea if that's actually true, but I don't see why she would lie. On one stormy night, my grandmother left my mother with my great-grandmother and drove out to her girlfriend's house. According to her, the two of them had planned to get drunk and listen to some records. She arrived at the dark farmhouse in the pouring rain and knocked on the front door, but did not get a response. Back then, when plans changed, you mostly didn't find out until it was too late. You couldn't send a text message or even call whenever you wanted. Figuring that something had happened, my grandmother decided to spend the night in the empty house anyway so she didn't have to drive back in the pouring rain and began searching for the spare key. She went around to the back of the house, the wind tearing at her coat and nearly knocking her over. She reached the back porch and continued her search for the spare key. Apparently, it wasn't in its normal spot, so she sat on the somewhat sheltered back porch behind a pile of firewood. She said her being too stubborn to go back home was what likely saved her life that night. She lit up a cigarette and sat smoking for an uncertain amount of time. She didn't want to break into her girlfriend's place, but she also didn't want to go back out in the rain and return to her car and drive back in these conditions, which had only gotten worse. She stated that lightning was crisscrossing all around the sky, and the wind was making the wooden fence lean at a sharp angle. She then saw a light come on from inside the house. It wasn't the light of a lamp or anything. It was a beam of light that flashed quickly. Figuring that her friend had returned home, she stood and pressed her face to the window. She didn't knock or call out, because she figured that the noise of the storm would just drown her out, so she just waited to be spotted by the window. The flashlight had disappeared into the other room, and after another moment, she caught sight of a man she didn't know, moving around way too slowly to be someone that knew the layout of the house. She only got a quick glimpse of him in the darkness, but she saw enough to know that it wasn't a member of the girlfriend's family. She thought it could have been a neighbor that she didn't know, but his suspicious behavior was making her uneasy so she ducked down and decided to wait a while, despite the raging storm. After a while of hiding, she crouched beneath the window and would occasionally see the flashlight beam dance across the back porch from one of the inside windows. She figured if it was someone who was supposed to be there, they would have either turned on a light, or at the very least, would have stopped wandering around so slowly as if they were looking for something. After what she suspects was a few minutes, the door to the back porch opened, and the stranger stepped outside and shined the light across the length of the porch, including the woodpile, which, fortunately, prevented her from being seen. She stayed hidden, and after another brief sweep with the flashlight, the person went back inside. The stranger could have easily found her, had he decided to take a look around, but she figured he doubted anyone would be hiding out there, given how rough the weather was. She heard the door slam again, and the stranger disappeared back inside the house. She peeked in through the window and watched as the man went upstairs. She waited in apprehension until he came back down to the ground floor, still carefully shining the flashlight around. He eventually wandered over to the front of the house, and then she heard the front door slam shut. Afraid that he may walk around the perimeter of the house and find her, she emerged from her hiding place and opened the back door, which was now unlocked. She carefully made her way inside and locked the door behind her. Without turning on any lights, she ran to the front door and locked it too before looking out to the front yard. She didn't spot the intruder anywhere. Shivering, she locked herself in the downstairs bathroom and covered herself up with towels. She was very aware that the man would potentially still be in the house or could even have his own key to gain access. After she dried herself off, she risked a quick run up the stairs and locked herself in her friend's bedroom. She had tried the light in the bedroom for a split second just to see if the power was out, which it wasn't. She then lay down on the bed. Exhausted, she nearly drifted off when a blinding flash came from outside, followed by a loud, thunderous cracking. It jolted her for a moment, but rational thought prevailed. One of the old trees out front must have been struck by lightning. She then fell asleep. The following day, she got up and searched the house in the daylight. There were no signs of her girlfriend or her family anywhere. She called her mother and then the police. 
An officer arrived a short while later, and she explained everything that happened the night before. Still unable to get a hold of her friend, the officer acknowledged that it may have been someone with permission to be in the house, but decided to take a look around anyway. After a while, he called to my grandmother. He asked my grandmother to describe what the stranger from the night before had been wearing, but she couldn't with any real certainty, as it had been too dark. Apparently, a body was discovered in the tall grass of the front yard. My grandmother's girlfriend returned home after the body had been removed from the property. She had been stranded several towns over the night before because of the road being washed out by the storm. The corpse was a man who had been an older friend of the family, but someone who most definitely did not have permission to be in their house, alone. As predicted, what had killed him had been a bolt of lightning that struck him down in the front yard. The man was carrying a six-inch hunting knife in his hand, which had likely been what attracted the strike. It was suspected that the man came looking for my grandmother's friend, as she had rejected his advances in the past. But when he spotted the strange car in the driveway, he decided to enter the house cautiously and find out who was visiting. This is all just a theory, but the family stressed this man would have never been allowed access to the house by himself, and they had nothing of his that he might have been looking for. My grandmother thinks that the timing of him leaving the house and the lightning strike was off. She said it was roughly a half hour window between her entering the house, locking up and drying off, before hearing the lightning strike. She doesn't think he was still in the process of leaving. She suspects he was on his way back. So there I was gliding down the stairs. Click, 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 click. As I mentioned before, he could just be a bit irresponsible and absent mind. He could just be a bit abs. He could be just. He could just be a bit. A he could just be a bit. Re he could just be a bit abs. He could be just. He could just be a bit. A he could just be a bit. Re he could just be a bit irresponsible and absent minded at times. <laughs> 